Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones and in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Gov, the podcast. I might need a fact check on this, but I was told today that Mercury is retrograde. Madison, Have you heard this? Ma- okay. So I don't know if it's specifically today. Because <laughs> I feel it. I'm pretty sure it is. The But like there was something weird going on like the last two weeks going up to this. Like every single one of my friends has been talking about where like just everything feels like a little off, like a little tense, like nothing in particular, just like everything's stressful, like nothing's working like the classic Mercury and retrograde situations. And I had Googled it. I don't remember. It's exactly today, but it was like coming up in December. So, yeah. and I'm also like PMSing and it's just, it's all happening at once for me. And it's also like the last week of work for me before the holiday break. So it's just like 1001 things going awry that I'm just like my head's about to explode so I don't know if anyone else is feeling that but one thing we love to do here at Girl on the Gov is complain and it's just important to make space it's important to make space this is the space for it it's a passion project it's a side hustle maybe Mm -hmm. honestly it's a main event because yeah I don't know what we would do without it. I just remember one year, this is like pre us knowing each other. One of your best friends and I were, she's like my old roommate, that guy. I don't think you've met her. But anyways, she was like, she'd so about like having a New Year's resolution riddle. I came to that resolution, which is so not my vibe. But I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, fine. What are we going to do for this? And she was like, we are not going to complain in whatever year it was. And I was like, it's not possible. It's, it's not, possible. not possible. She was like, okay, but like, what if it's only complaining about things that are constructive to complain about? I was like, all complaining is <laughs> constructive. I don't think we lasted 24 hours. I definitely yeah. didn't. She might have. She's like, she's better at like the, I have a goal and I'm going to like achieve the goal. Mm. I'm like, oh, there's a goal. Let me railroad myself 10 different ways before I even get anywhere near that goal. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's just been a lot. Today I was telling you I was like going to go work outside of the office and I just like didn't go because I couldn't find an outfit. And then like I missed the like four buses I could have taken to get there. And it's just like, yeah, like, you're just, just not going. Taking out. I need to rest. I'm exhausted. And all the PMS symptoms are in full action. And it's just it's just that time. Look, it's a safe space for venting, complaining, all the things. That's what we'll say. It's maybe not a safe space for George Santos, but it is for complaining. So well, take that. It is according to the last want. episode because we're trying to get him on the show. Don't forget. Oh, last we I not did forget, forget about the goal. Let's see if that Zwe episode is out or not. I should have looked at that for. Oh my first, god, I saw but... the like promo TikTok and was dying or Instagram or something. So and cute. she was like, it was a picture of them, and he was like holding her Birkin. She was yep. like, he's our. He already stole my work in with the book. <laughs> <laughs> Obsessed. I but mean. how was DC? It was so fun. I like did not want to leave at all whatsoever. It is such a just like it is its own universe. Like mm-hmm. it does not like nowhere else in the world like operates like DC. And I find it fascinating. But you win on the footwear predicament of mm. whatever year as we're keeping. I won't you know, win until safe. you until you ride a bike. Okay, first of all, at one of the events I was at, (laughs) biking did come up because of the complaints and whatever. See, I just, I said, fuck it. And I just walked barefoot at one point in between two places involved in one of the events I was at, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure was the classiest, most DC thing. When you texted me that you did that, I was like, It also didn't I, help. I think this... DC specifically is a place where like, like that just like doesn't <laughs> does not fly. <laughs> I just did not like you can it. get away with it in like San Diego, like everyone's barefoot there, New York, everyone's weird. I saw like maybe honestly you could get away with it. You can get away with a lot of shit here too. But like DC, yeah, it's not the place. Okay, this is let me just state my case. Okay. So this is now this is now courtroom. So basically, as per usual, I think in the class universe sense, I can walk anywhere. I can. I can walk anywhere. It does not matter the distance or the shoe. I got this. And I stupidly wore a new pair of boots during like my meetings throughout the day. And I got like a blister on one side. Okay. Actually four specifically. 
And then on the other sh- on the other foot, it was fine. But then I was compensating and I pretty much twisted my ankle in that fucking boot. So I've got a busted up ankle. I've got like a foot with like so many. Oh, oh, to make things worse, I have a cut on my hand, a broken nail, an orange hand with white thumb. It was like just one of those things. I could not catch a fucking like aesthetic break. It's ridiculous. Like talking to a bunch of climate bros that are also from New York. And I just, the problem that's like my, not that the climate bro specifically, it was like my comfort zone, but a bunch of dudes, like fratty dudes from New York, totally <laughs> my comfort zone, didn't even think to even flinch, was like talking to them, trying to walk, was like f- like flailing. And I'm like a good heels walker, so you know it's bad if like I like can't keep the shoes on. Right. And I just said, fuck it. And I like took them off, walked it. It was only like five feet. Oh, and then this was weird for all the things. So the like second part of this one event so this place called Sukatosh, which is a restaurant in DC. And I'm looking at it and I was like, oh my God, Sukatosh, Sukatosh, like whatever. I'm looking around and like it kind of feels familiar, but like couldn't place it until this morning. I did the design PR on this restaurant. Like I submitted to like all these magazine things. I was like, oh my God. what is with this ceiling? Like something about it. Like <laughs> couldn't place it. it took Small me 24 world, hours. Man. So weird. So freaking weird. Well, but it was, it was cool. And there's some exciting content coming from it, isn't there? There is, which stay tuned, guys. I am dead, so I'm going to be putting up like the video stuff tomorrow when I like have half a brain. But there's going to be lots of video content. Some um, I got like one or two little man on the street interviews. I did. So we have two people, two state representatives that are going to be coming on the show in January that are a part of Future Caucus, which is like one of the things I was there with. And they are so awesome, you guys. Like it kind of like, I don't know, like, you know, I'm not a sap, but like call me inspired i literally like they actually like give me like hope for humanity go fucking figure that's rare i know i know that's like that's when you when you know i'm never has hope she never has positivity (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) rude (laughs) no but seriously so basically what they do and we'll obviously get so into it only that particular episode come january see this week i subscribe Got to subscribe before we go on our holiday break because, which side note, all the newsletters will still be going throughout January and all that. We're just taking a little, like the holiday podcast break. Anyways, long, long story short is they basically have created a space in which, and caucuses, where state and also federal lawmakers can come together across the aisle and actually find solutions and talk to each other and like they actually fucking work together and pass legislation and so like and it's all like young lawmakers it's gen z's and millennials and senials and like it's really cool it's not across all issue areas it's like abortion and guns are not a part of like that conversation but what i find like which is classic but where i do find important to like know is like just because you can't make progress on one issue with a rep across the aisle why do all the other issues have to suffer in the meantime like you have to keep going you have to and you're not going to also make any progress on those other two issues if you don't have the relationships across the aisle to try and like talk some sense you may never agree you may never vote the same but i just think that the spaces that they're creating are so key especially in these state legislatures which are so underrated and critically important and it's cool to see the federal government can take a lesson from for sure no, seriously. But there's 33 caucuses right now, 33 states involved. They're adding more. But the caucus that we're going to have two representatives from is Vermont. And one of the, like, I feel like funniest pieces of, like, the content that I'm just obsessed with. So I was trying, we were trying to do some, like, man on the street type interviews, but it was, like, a little loud in, like, the space we were in. So we, like, pivoted and decided to take some candid pics. And it's me and this Republican rep from Vermont. And, like, you know, like, a classic like dad like so nice like you're gonna love chatting with him like it was, i chatted public education with him for quite some time because i had my little little elementary school stint in vermont so i had a lot to a lot to say a lot to say. <laughs> and anyways it's literally like we took this like a 10 second video of me instructing him how to like do a candidate i was like think you're at a coffee shop you're talking with your friends like oh you're God. laughing the jokes are cr- like it is like the most i can't like find like the right words to put to it but i was lol that's so why high. we also consult candidates and electives <laughs> on how I was like, is this our to ad? social media <laughs> hashtag viral go sign up like, that's hilarious and very precious and i'm excited to have our first ever republican on the show 
<laughs> no, me too. It's it's going to be cool. I'm like I'm genuinely like really excited. Like I'm always excited for like all of our guests and like episodes, but this one I think is going to be really cool. And he was such a gem, such a as as the toasty girls say a pjam or pjam. 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 Precious gem of a man. Yes. Well, either way, shall we, we introduce shall. our guests? Okay, so this is. I know we just talked about another episode that we're doing, but this episode is also going fucking great. It's baller. And it's a topic that we literally have never covered. And I'm so glad that we're covering it because so many questions. So many questions. We're talking about big hospital and like the hospital lobby and price transparency. Mm -hmm. Like when you go into a hospital and you're, you need a procedure and they like don't tell you like how much it is in advance or Mm -hmm. doctors, all that. We are talking about like why that is, what changes are like being made to sort of change that game and make sure that like there's actual like transparency with customers aka literally all of us so we brought in sophia tripoli who's the senior director of health policy at families usa to have this conversation which literally this is like her focus area expert du jour so perfection 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 so let's fucking get into it without further ado here's sophia All right. Well, we have got to get into it. You are the Senior Director of Health Policy at Families USA. Those that might not be as familiar with the organization and what you guys do, can you give us the lay of the land? You know, what do you guys do? What's the focus? All that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk about some issue areas that are very near and dear to my heart and to the organization's heart. Families USA is a national nonpartisan organization working on behalf of all people across the United States to ensure that every person has high quality, affordable health care and improved health that they deserve. And our work is driven by four major focus areas. We work on healthcare value, so making sure that healthcare is affordable and that it's high quality, health equity, healthcare coverage, and bringing forward people's experience with the healthcare system. And at the core of what we do, our work is really driven by public policy analysis That's rooted in experiences in Congress and the federal administration, movement building and advocacy in collaboration with partners so that we can actually advance pro-consumer policies or defend against policies that are not so pro-consumer. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, the healthcare system is vast, right? And there's like so many different corners of it, but like we want to talk about hospitals specifically today. So can you kind of give us the current landscape around hospitals and like financial health and kind of what we're seeing in terms of hospitals opening, closing, all the things? Yes, absolutely. Well, right now we are in the midst of a healthcare affordability and quality crisis. We know that nearly half Americans can't afford to see the doctor when they need to because of costs. Almost one third of Americans say that the cost of medical care actually interferes with their ability to secure basic needs like paying for rent or buying groceries. And we have 100 million people in this country who are in medical debt. At the core of this crisis um, is really driven by decades of unchecked consolidation in the healthcare sector, particularly among hospitals. That's really resulted in this really big shift in the role of hospitals in our communities. They are no longer these community-based entities that are staffed by volunteers and funded by donations like they were nearly 60 years ago, but instead they've become these mega large healthcare corporations that are focused on profit maximization and a business model that's really focused on two things. The first is buying up competition so they can gain more market power in order to increase healthcare prices year after year. And the second part of the business model is about generating high numbers of highest priced services. And what this looks like in hospital pricing is that hospital prices have actually really increased pretty rapidly over the last several decades. Since 1990, hospital prices have grown 600%. Just since 2015, we've seen those prices increase 31% nationally. Hospital, the hospital sector now accounts for one third of US healthcare centi- uh, spending and hospital prices are growing four times faster than workers' paychecks. And these prices are not just high, they really vary substantially across the country. For example, an MRI and health system in Wisconsin can cost anywhere from $1,000 to $4,000, just depending on which insurance coverage you might have, four times more depending on the insurance. 
or if you take a knee replacement across the country, very common service for seniors in our country, the average price of a, of a knee replacement can be uh, $21,000 in Tucson, Arizona, or more than $60,000 in Sacramento, California. And this is particularly problematic for the American families because these higher prices are experienced in the forms of higher healthcare premiums every single year, higher cost sharing, higher deductibles, higher out-of-pocket costs for American families. So these prices are not just are not the only driver of the of the United States healthcare affordability crisis, but is definitely one of the major drivers right now. And these higher prices we're seeing drive up healthcare premiums and making it really difficult for Americans to afford their healthcare. Yeah, and I'm so curious about the consolidation element of this whole thing. Like, why are we seeing hospitals or also have seen hospitals consolidate? Like, why does this benefit them? It's a great question. So we've seen a pretty steady increase in consolidation over the last several decades in the healthcare system. It really dates back to the 1990s after the Clinton administration, President Clinton had his attempts at health reform, which failed in the early 1990s. The healthcare system was in the midst of this shift to what's called managed care in the late 1990s, and hospitals and providers quickly turned to consolidation as a way to help manage financial financial risk and to increase leverage in their contract negotiations with managed care organizations. And according to the American Hospital uh, Association, during that time, there were a significant number of hospital mergers that occurred in the late 1990s, and that has uh, steadily increased to now what we see in in today's markets, we've got 90% of U.S. healthcare markets that are considered heavily consolidated. That means that those markets have virtually no competition. So those big hospital corporations are really in a position where they can set any healthcare price they want without any sort of intervention to say, hey, that's that's actually not really a fair price. That's crazy. Well, for some background too, can you kind of tell us the difference between for-profit and nonprofit hospitals? Yes, absolutely. So in the simplest terms, for-profit hospitals are those that are investor-owned and they are motivated to make profit for their holders. That's for-profit. Now, when it comes to nonprofits under federal tax law, nonprofit hospital corporations are actually granted tax-exempt status. And it's premised on the assumption that they're providing a community benefit. So by definition, under federal law, tax law, tax-exempt hospitals are not allowed to generate and distribute profits. And in exchange, their tax-exempt status protects billions of dollars in revenue for these, these institutions. Now, really important to note that the Affordable Care Act included some new requirements for tax-exempt hospitals to actually report community need and had some limit and to limit some of the charges and billing. But for many nonprofits, they continue to charge exorbitant prices for the services, and they're putting a lot of families on paid medical debt and collections and investing in new services and technologies that expand their revenue instead of actually meeting their community benefit. And there's a lot of data to, to talk through and sort of exemplify what that looks like. But just to give you this one point, more than 80% of nonprofit hospitals and healthcare system spend less on charity care and community investment than the amount they receive through their tax breaks as nonprofit institutions. So it's a really big um, distinction between the nonprofit and the for-profit systems. Yeah. And I'm really curious about the not-for-profits or nonprofit hospitals. Like, how do they get away with keeping this tax-exempt status? Like, it kind of reminds me of thinking about churches. And then you see, like, at (laughs) Christmas time, like, literally, like, performances that are bigger and more expensive than what you see on Broadway. And you're like, wait a second where like how is this tax exempt and so same question here you know just it seems so fishy to me well i think you know in any sort of there's always like legal interpretations of the language and i think one of the areas of advocacy that families usa and a lot of partners who are working in this space have been working on is trying to sharpen some of the definitions that are written in sort of the legal statute that uh, for tax law about what is it actually mean to meet a, a community benefit. And there's a, you know, and to close some of the loopholes in the way that language is written so that it's very clear that, you know, what the requirements are. And I think the other point to say is the special special interests in the hospital sector are very powerful and very well resourced. And so a lot of money is spent every year 
to preserve the status quo of the hospital business interest because it is generating so much uh, revenue or operating margins for shareholders if it's in the for-profit sector and in the nonprofit sector is creating a lot of business revenue for for those institutions. So there's a lot of vested interest in trying to preserve the business, the status quo of the business interests. Yeah. I also had a question about the for-profit, just the shareholders. Like what is, who are those people usually who kind of backs for-profit hospitals? One of the things that we're seeing growing and like popping up and, and trending more is around sort of like angel investors and um, private equity firms, which we're seeing a lot of increase in private equity for- firms in the healthcare sector. And it's really, yeah, and it's really in this like profit maximization, like cutting costs, short mm-hmm. time horizon business opportunity that they're seeing uh, a lot of profit opportunity and coming in, buying up a hospital or a system, cutting costs, stopping, you know, eliminating services. Like we're seeing a lot of reporting around cutting back on maternal health services and, and all that type of stuff. Um, which of course has really negative consequences yeah. for the communities that they're serving, particularly in rural areas where there are no other service options. And then laying workers off to cut costs, cutting expenses, and then in you know five to seven years reselling for the profit. And so we're seeing a lot more private equity backed firms getting into the healthcare sector and sort of that business model. Wow. Yeah, it's always crazy seeing that business model like seen it across other industries and it usually never works. And yet every and VC and every PE like firm. People. Yeah, totally. It's like, okay, guys, like how many of your businesses have literally done bankruptcy like chapter 11 and we're still doing this and now we're putting it towards healthcare? <laughs> I can't. Anyways, the audacity of men, which I'm going to really blame that <laughs> one on. It just feels right. But anyways, in terms of the pricing that these schmucks come up with, how do they come up with it? Like what is there like a basis, like a, a guidebook that they're like, okay, like these are, you know, this is where the prices come from. What's the deal with that? Sure. It's a great question. So for public health care programs, so for Medicare, for example, the federal government actually establishes what the prices for services are. There's a very technical methodology that they use to, to determine um, what should the price for a particular service be. Now, there's a lot of criticism about whether that's the best methodology and can it be improved? And there are flaws, but that's sort of the Medicare sets uh, a, a price. Um, and then because Medicare uh, is Medicare and they, it's such a big program and it's the federal government, it often establishes the benchmark of what is then paid across the healthcare system. So in for Medicaid services, and then also into what we refer to as like the commercial market, where we see people who rely on employer sponsored insurance and are in the exchanges and all that type of stuff. So for, for, People who are getting Medicare, the federal government is setting the price and they're paying, you know, based on the proportion of per premiums, et cetera. But for people who are in the private market, which is like 176 million Americans who rely on the employer and sponsored insurance and the exchanges and the private market for health insurance, prices are set uh, based on competition or the lack of competition in the healthcare market. So what I mean by that is that we've seen Basically, we see insurance companies and healthcare providers, they take the Medicare price and they negotiate based off of that. Sometimes it's a percentage of Medicare, but what really comes down to what the ultimate price is, is based on market power. So we've seen as hospitals have been consolidating and gaining market power, it really helps them gain leverage over the negotiations with insurers, who, by the way, are also consolidating and trying to have enough power. And it's all about the negotiations about who can get a better price who can have more covered lives, who can control the information, and it gives them the competitive edge over price. What that dynamic, which is often like in health economics is referred to as like a bilateral monopoly, that dynamic is what sets the price for healthcare services. Now those prices in some markets are three, 400, 500% of what Medicare pays. And it's only based on, purely based on consolidation. How much market power does that entity have and their ability to command the higher price. That's it. It's not higher quality care. And in fact, in a lot of cases, it's the same quality or worse quality, or it's an MRI. And that's the difference between like a $500 MRI and a $4,000 MRI. It's just market power that's, that's commanding that price. And then I think what's important to say about these prices is that they're not public. Nobody actually knows what they are. 
these prices are buried in contract terms and legalese, and it's con they're considered proprietary information. So we actually don't know what the underlying healthcare price of a service is. All we know is what we end up paying, which is based on what type of insurance you have and what your you know your premiums are and your out-of-pocket expenses are based on your insurance coverage. Or if you're uninsured, you're just getting a bill and you don't actually know what the real price of that service is. You're just paying whatever the hospital tells you you have to pay. Yeah, it's so to me, crazy. I the whole thing is so crazy, and that like, like you think of like anything mm -hmm. else, like you go to the market, there's a price like on the apples. You go to the market down the street, yeah. and you're like, oh, that's a better price. Like you can fairly see. What I'm like so confused of too is like you know how like with certain businesses, like if they don't advertise properly, like it's misleading, you can like sue. Like how like McDonald's for example, or I think it's McDonald's, one of the fast food ones recently got sued because their like burger wasn't like as big as it looked in the like advertising image. And so I'm like kind of confused in the essence of like, how are those lawsuits not hitting hospitals? Because how are you not able to share what the product is and the price? Like, how is that legal to just like be like, eh, guess and game, you'll find out when you find out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, it's a really good question. I mean, you as individuals, you can try to bring lawsuit, but you know, these are, you have to have a lot of resources to be able to yeah. go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with with these multi-million, billion-dollar uh, corporations who are going to put everything into keeping those prices hidden. It's part of their business model. They're able to command such high prices because we actually can't really pinpoint exactly what the price difference is in. So for a lot of policymakers, they're like, well, we don't know. But there is an awakening to it. And I'll say like a lot of this comes to some of the work that we've been doing around what's called hospital, you know, price transparency. And there are these two regulations that were implemented under the Trump administration, actually. Um, and what they did is they, for the first time in history, they required health plans and hospitals to actually disclose what the underlying price of a healthcare service is. And over the last several years, as that those regulations have been implemented, we have seen uh, hospitals pull out all the works to try to to try to keep the prices hidden. And so. There's a really huge national effort going on, and there's a lot of major legislation in Congress that that's bipartisan, Republicans and Democrats coming together because they're they're starting to come to the same conclusions that you guys just came to, which is like how this is like the one of the only sectors in the US economy that we actually don't know what the price of something is until we get a service and we get billed. It's outrageous. You know, it's, it's completely outrageous. outrageous. And for hospitals in particular, you guys know if you've gone in and you've had you had to get any, any into the emergency department or you have to go into any hospital to get service for a family member or yourself, you have to sign on the dotted line. I'm going to pay whatever the bill is that you send me. So if the hospitals are going to make you sign on the dotted line, we have to pay any bill. At the very least, legally, they need to be able to tell us what the price for that service is before we have to sign. And that gives consumers a lot stronger legal case that they can actually bring for, to lawsuit if we could get some of that, some of those requirements put into law. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I was going to say too. Cause it's like, if you're going in for an MRI, like that's something maybe it's more planned and you don't have to like, it's not an emergency service. So like right. that should for sure be like a set price. That's right. When an emergency situation, that's the same thing though, but it's like, okay, now I'm going to go in. I like literally have to get this or else per potentially I could die, but I don't know what it's going to cost. But like, I can see how a hospital would be like, well, we don't know what we're going to like need to do for you or whatever, but it's just so crazy all of it and that makes me curious too when you talk about like bipartisan legislation also shout out trump i don't know <laughs> for that for that moment but what type of legislation is pending as far as like pricing transparency like what are we looking at for solutions yeah it's a great question so yes the trump administration <laughs> on healthcare families usa we often were not on the same side of the trump administration on on many issues um, but mm -hmm. on this particular issue um it was an important step forward the biden administration has continued working to implement um those regulations but obviously we're seeing such low compliance from hospitals they're playing a lot of games so we've been doing a lot of work with partners to get members of congress paying attention and understanding why this information is so important. So over the last, you know, year plus, we've seen a really, really strong bipartisan effort from members, from Congress members on the House in particular, but some folks on the Senate side as well, who have made it their mission to try to get hospital price transparency codified into statute, so it just becomes the law of the land. 
On the House side, the most important legislation to lift up is the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act. It's bipartisan legislation. Uh, you know, various committees worked on their own iteration of it and came together to, to agree on this sort of package. And it's ready to come to the to a, a vote on the House floor. And so we're working really hard to get the new Speaker of the House and the committee leadership to 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 do exactly that. On the Senate side, the price transparency has been a little bit of a harder uphill battle to make the case. And so we've got a few champions on the Senate side, but we continue to make the case around price transparency and why it's so important for the American people to actually understand what healthcare prices are before before they get the bill. Totally. I just feel like the hospital system just feels like the modern day mob. Like that's <laughs> That's just yes. the vibe I get, which say a lot of But in terms of the people behind the scenes, big hospital, as like we refer to it, a girl of the gov, who are those people? Who are the lobbyists? Like, what are the orgs that are trying to say, oh, no, no, no. Like, let's keep this up and shady. Who are those people? <laughs> up and shady. Yeah, I love it. Yes, uh, I do too. Okay, so I think like the biggest, the biggest one to met- note is the American Hospital Association. They're definitely like the big the big muscle, you know, lobbying for hospital business interests and to preserve the status quo. They serve, you know, over 6,000 hospital and healthcare systems and networks and across the country. And they they spend a lot of money on, on you know, lobbying for, for the hospital sector. But then there's also other, like hospital, so other types of associations that represent hospitals, the Federation of American Hospitals, um, we see also individual health systems and hospital systems doing their own lobbying, like HCA, uh, for example, Inc., which is like a, it's a huge system. It's got nearly 2000 hospitals across 20 states in the United States. And then it's also got some hospitals over in the UK. Tenet Health is a huge healthcare system. The Greater New York Hospital Association. So then we see like state hospital associations also advocating and lobbying on behalf of the hospital business interests in their states. To their local representatives at the state level, but then also to their members of Congress in here in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. What? OK, so what is I think I know the answer, but like, what is the main goal of these lobbyists? Like, is it is it purely just like maximize profits or are there kind of other, I guess, priorities kind of big hospital lobbyists have? I mean, I think they they have a ton of, pol- you know, every the hospital association and they they publish this and the individual organizations do too. They have a lot of different policy issue areas that they're advocating for in lobbying on behalf of around, you know, hospital, the hospital sector. I think we would argue that at the core of a lot, maybe not all, but at many of those policy priorities are around preserving this this business model, allowing hospitals to continue to consolidate so they can increase prices and then just allowing hospitals to generate as many high price services as they possibly can. But not all of them, right? There are some other issue areas that the hospital associations have been critically important for, like the, expand- the fight to extend Medicaid for individuals who rely on Medicaid coverage, low-income individuals. Hospitals associations were champions for that. You know, extending healthcare coverage has been an important priority of, of the hospital association and we fought hand in hand um, with them on some of those issues as, as well. Totally. It makes sense, especially just sort of seeing how some of these rural states or even more red states, like they're not accepting the money, like the federal money, and then it's just sitting there and the hospitals rely on it, especially in rural areas. So it's like, I, I see how like sometimes like the lines get blurred between the parties and sort of odd bedfellows, if you will, of, yeah, you know, you might be aligned on one issue and not on another and i'm curious like from that dynamic like what the relationships are like like how do you guys not kill each other like that (laughs) is the real question so i think you know one of the real privileges of working at families usa is that we're an organization that's not beholden to any special interest or any political party um we really just get to show up and fight for what is the best thing for the families in this country every single day. And sometimes that means we're hand in hand with the hospital association. Sometimes that means we're pointing our, you know, we're taking on the big drug companies. Sometimes that means we're working with Republicans or Democrats. We really, you know, the way that we've, we have success on our issue areas is we figure out what partners do we need at the table to be able to Mm -hmm. advance any issue area forward. That's important for the American people. 
And sometimes it really does mean bringing together strange, bed, strange bedfellows. Sometimes mm-hmm. it does mean we're fighting against the Trump administration, against imposing work requirements in the Medicaid program, but we're supporting the work they're doing on hospital price transparency. So it's we have to be very sort of nuanced and um, like policy ninjas is sometimes how we, how we joke around about it at work. I love policy ninjas. We will be using that moving forward for sure. <laughs> well, how can people kind of get involved, but also kind of help push change on a lot of these topics? I think um, healthcare is many, many, many people's like first or top priorities and issue areas. So just curious kind of from your perspective, what's the best way to push for change and to kind of tackle this big monster, but also to like get involved with you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the most important thing to do, there's a few. I think the first one is if you're hearing this and you're fired up about this issue, contact your local member of Congress and let them know how much, how important it is to make sure that we have price transparency in healthcare. So that's the first thing. I would say the second thing is if you have a story and you have a story from yourself or a family member or a neighbor or a loved one that has had a rough go at it or has an experience that could help illuminate what this looks like um, for people's lives. Famous USA has a storytelling program and encourage you to, you know, reach out to us on our website and we can get you connected if you're interested in sharing your story. And that's so important because sometimes these policy issue areas are really wonky and for policymakers in in particular, they can sort of, we can all sort of forget, well, what is the real world impact of this on somebody's life? And so being able to tell a story of, I literally could not pay that medical bill and put food on the table to feed my family. That's a powerful story that every policy maker needs to hear every single day to remind them about why they hold their their job in office and the Mm -hmm. role that they have in, in meeting the needs of their constituents. And then the third thing is families is running. We've got a lot of different ways you can get involved. Probably the most, the fastest and most expeditious way is to go to a campaign website that we're running right now. It's an effort to get some of these pieces of legislation that Congress are considering, this particular this House legislation that I referred to, the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act, enacted into law. And folks can go to www.sameprice, same service.com. It's all, I'm sorry, org. It's all one word. And there's a take action button. Folks can click on it. It helps you send a letter right to your member of Congress. And that tells them to get price transparency done and get some other really important pieces of legislation for, for consumers done on healthcare this year. So, well, we love an action item. Love. That is for sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for walking us through some of the nuances of this issue and the players and all of that. For closing notes, where can people find you guys? How can people you know, sort of follow along? What are all the plugs? Yes, I was actually, I was preparing for you guys to ask me that. So fam- you guys can... <laughs> Uh, Famous USA is literally www.famoususa.org. Folks can send me an email at S-T-R-I-P-O-L-I. That's S Tripoli at famoususa.org. And we can get you guys looped into whether you want to tell a story or whether you want to just have a, a chat about something. But those are the two best ways to to get in contact with us. Amazing. All right. Yay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you guys thank for you. having me and really appreciate you taking the time to 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 walk through something that's kind of wonky but really important to making sure that we can make healthcare affordable for everyone. Totally, totally.